I think that um, maybe we will um, start the session, if that sounds okay. We've got a few people um, here in the room. Um, and uh, yeah, so I'd just like to welcome you all. This is the um, second of uh, two sessions that we're running on the uh, around mental health. Um, uh, this has been hosted by the U21 Health Sciences Group uh, Mental Health Working Group. Uh, so I'd really like to welcome you all. Thank you for coming along today. Um, my name is Vivian Brown. I um, am the Associate Director of uh, Government Relations and Policy, actually, at an organisation called Origin, which is a youth mental health research centre uh, attached to the University of Melbourne um, in Australia. I'm also uh, the Chair of uh, the U21 Health Science Group Mental Health Working Group that I uh, mentioned before. I'm joined in hosting this session by uh, my colleague on that group, uh, Professor Stuart Carney, who's the Medical Dean of the University of Queensland. Thanks for the wave, Stuart. Um, so as I said, this is the second of two sessions that's hosted by our group. Um, the group itself, just a, a little bit of context, was established following the U21 Health Sciences Group annual meeting back in 2018 that was hosted in Melbourne. Um, and at the end of that meeting, there was a decision made to develop up a declaration for supporting mental health in U21 universities. Um, so that followed on a number of presentations and a program that was delivered looking specifically at mental health and university students. The declaration itself was uh, launched at the Dublin U21 Health Sciences Group meeting last year. Um, after a process of a couple of years of development and um, attaining the president's endorsement as well. And so for this session, we're actually focusing um, specifically on postgraduate or higher research students um, and, and supporting their mental health and wellbeing. They're a group that's often been discussed um, as being at high risk of experiencing stress, distress and poor wellbeing. Um, there was probably a, um, an even more recent survey uh, of around 3,500 graduate students at 12 public universities during COVID um, pandemic, which has shown that, uh, again, some of these risk factors have been exacerbated with uh, almost 70% of survey responses in that um, research reporting um, scores very low on wellbeing and um, around 35% with moderate or higher levels of depression. So today we're going to hear presentations uh, from the University of Queensland and UC Davis in California and specifically on their research and work looking at graduate student mental health and wellbeing. As this session is going to be hosted in a Zoom meeting format, I'd like to ask that everyone put themselves on mute and use the chat function to ask questions while the presentations are occurring. Um, we'll either get to them after each presentation or we'll collate them and ask questions at the end in a Q&A session. So firstly, um, I'd like to welcome Belinda Byrne and Dr. Stacey Parker from the University of Queensland. I'm really thrilled that they're able to join us um, in Australia at the moment. It's 6am in the morning, so it's been a very um, early start with uh, lots of coffee already. Um, Belinda's the director of UQ, UQ Graduate School and Stacey's the director of the Centre of Business and Organisational Psychology at UQ. So their work has been to understand more deeply the factors contributing um, to positive HDR um, experience, including indicators of well-being and engagement and factors that should contribute to these positive experiences. So with that, it's enough of me talking. I'm going to hand over to Stacey and Belinda um, to take it from here. Thanks, Vivian. And hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for inviting us along today. Um, we're really pleased to be able to uh, talk to you about a, a project that we only initiated about 18 months ago, um, but it's uh, showing some really, um, it's valuable work and it, it's showing some really early um, in interesting results. So we're, we're keen to, um, to see where it goes. Um, this project is a bit of a collaboration um, with staff and some PhD research partners across UQ. Uh, so, um, myself and another member of our um, higher degree by research committee um, also uh, worked uh, with um, some researchers and some PhD students from a few different areas across UQ, UQ including Stacey of course as well. Uh, so it's a, a big project team, uh, 12 people all together and we really came together to more deeply understand um, the, not just the contributing factors, I guess, to, to um, mental health and other issues with um, well-being 
and engagement for HDR students, but we really in particular wanted to see um, what were those um, links between um, different aspects of, of their research culture, their research environment, uh, supervision. Um, we looked at career identity and a range of other things uh, just to be able to get a more complete picture and, and really to look at um, what, what things most impacted on the well-being of our students right now. And, uh, and so we, we did extensive um, uh, literature reviews and we looked at other, um, other surveys and, and data that was out there and um, we, we built our own survey, I guess. Um, it's designed as a longitudinal survey, so we're um, looking to run this um, every year. Um, it ran for the first time in November last year. So we, um, we ran it just with our UQ cohort um, and uh, we're looking to do that again in November this year. And we'll take you through some of our recommendations and, and next steps uh, towards the end of the presentation. Um, I think I might be handing over to Stacey now. Yes. Thank you, Belinda. Um, so just uh, first to describe a little bit of our uh, sample from 2020. We got a total of 746 respondents, uh, which is about 16% of our whole student cohort. So not quite as much of a response rate as we were hoping, but it was in the midst of the 2020 pandemic. Uh, and what was very reassuring was that the sample was still quite representative um, of our cohort across a range of different factors like degree type, international domestic student status um, and other factors. So first I'm just gonna take you through uh, dist some distribution plots of the main outcomes we looked at, which were wellbeing and engagement outcomes. Uh, as already highlighted, we have a focus on some of those more positive general uh, wellbeing indicators, as well as some factors related to engagement like motivation and satisfaction as well as some of the more uh, mental ill health issues that our HDRs can encounter. And what we're seeing in our data um, in general is that there is some um, slightly higher than um, the midpoint uh, sort of life satisfaction, meaning in life and resilience in the cohort. And overall, they're much more intrinsically motivated in terms of their motivation for their studies. Um, but uh, satisfaction uh, is a little bit more mixed across the cohort. And nevertheless, they do still have some significant experiences in terms of burnout, as well as loneliness and psychological distress. I'll just note these last two are measured actually on the five point scale uh, rather than the seven. So there is, that is around the mean uh, point there, that um, midpoint there, that level of loneliness and distress. Then we also wanted to look into the predictors of those outcomes and we looked at a range of factors as uh, Belinda started to allude to. And we used a novel type of um, analytic technique to look into this data, which is cross-sectional survey data uh, measured at one point in time. So we use what's called a network analysis. And so this first network I'm showing you is those outcomes I showed you the distributions of before. Um, including some of the more sort of uh, negative factors and some of the more positive factors. And um, the lines between these indicate the nature of the association between them. So blue is positive. So if I feel more satisfied with my life overall, I tend to also feel I have more meaning in life. And the negative lines are a negative association. So it tends not to be the case that you're both satisfied with your HDR and simultaneously burnt out. These tend to be uh, inversely correlated. And um, what we found is that the factors of psychological distress and HDR uh, satisfaction um, and also life satisfaction have some of the strongest interconnections in this wellbeing and engagement network. So these might be particularly significant outcomes to focus on. What we did next, but was we overlaid this network with different categories of our predictors. And so what I'm gonna show you next is our category for the support resources that we investigated. So we have the same um, wellbeing and engagement outcomes as before, 
uh, which are appearing in the orange and blue. And now in green, we have the support resources that we were interested in seeing. To what extent do they explain uh, wellbeing and engagement outcomes? And you can see that um, this analysis is taking into account the intercorrelations among our outcomes, but also the intercorrelations among our predictors. So um, it's just taking into account that shared, um, the shared sort of associations here. The most pertinent outcomes that were revealed was that uh, HDR peer support, so support from peers at the university was linked to lower loneliness, whereas personal support outside of the university, friends and families, partner, was associated with lower loneliness, but also greater life satisfaction. And of the various advisor related uh, resources that we looked um, into, it was the principal advisor support that was linked to greater levels of uh, HDR satisfaction. Um, that was the most uh, sort of significant finding there, rather than other factors that we looked into like financial support, autonomy, or associate advisor support. We also looked into how our students are integrating their study and life, looking at a range of different factors, like how they, whether they're integrators or segmenters, whether they're experiencing conflict, whether they feel like it's authentically imbalanced, how they like it, and also um, the things that they're doing to sort of manage their energy. So how they approach each day to make sure they can face it with a fresh pair of eyes, which is this proactive vitality management, as well as various things they can do in their leisure time to recover, um, and so, which helps to prevent things like burnout. And what we found is that they are experiencing uh, conflict, which is associated with more burnout and psychological distress, which is just here. Um, but the more they're feeling like the way they're doing the juggle is authentic with their values, the more satisfied they are overall with their HDR experience they're also more intrinsically motivated and have a uh, lower burnout. And interestingly, the people who are more actively trying to uh, manage their energy, they have greater resilience, greater meaning in life and intrinsic motivation as well. Of the different little recovery approaches we studied, it was relaxation experiences and downtime that were the most uh, important associated with less loneliness and psychological distress. We also looked into their broader context within their units, so within schools and institutes, looking at a range of factors to do with the culture of those units, including the research culture. And um, some of the factors that we looked into in relation to research culture were not significantly associated directly with wellbeing and engagement outcomes, um, but they certainly drive other factors that were. In particular, a sense that there's high publication pressure was associated with greater burnout as well as psychological distress, the lines just underneath the graph there. But experiencing a greater sense of belongingness in your local unit was linked to lower levels of loneliness. Also units that supported the segmentation of work and life without um, you know, pressure to work all the time or be on all the time was linked to lower burnout. And finally, we also looked into some career and identity factors um, looking at things to do with was the experience, is the experience of their HDR more positive or more negative than what they expected? Are they confident to complete? Do they feel like a competent researcher? What are they thinking about in terms of their career uh, prospects in the future? Having um, experiencing the HDR is more positive than expected was linked to greater satisfaction and lower burnout. So there's something there about having good expectations about what is involved. Feeling like a competent researcher was associated with less burnout, while confidence to complete more satisfaction and meaning in life. Career distress, which is worry about not knowing what to do um, in terms of your career in the future, was associated with more psychological distress. But thinking that you've got good prospects because you're developing good transferable skills uh, was associated with more intrinsic motivation and feeling like that career, the future looks bright, more meaning in life. Interestingly, of the identity factors we looked into, it was holding a student identity that was associated with more intrinsic motivation and those who want to stay in academia also with more intrinsic motivation. Now I'll pass back to Belinda to talk about our recommendations and next steps.
Thanks, Stacey. Uh, so you can see uh, there are a lot of, it's a lot of data that we, um, we were able to obtain even just in this early phase. And, and we're, we're thinking of this as our pilot stage, um, but you can see that those um, outcomes and indicators are starting to link to support for the person, uh, development and resources for the person, um, studying a research by higher degree program. We're also starting to look at then the research environment factors and also um, as, as Stacey described, the impact on their advisor or their supervisory team. So, uh, so you can see that we've, we've started to think about some recommendations and changes we might suggest in, in those uh, categories. Um, I mean, most immediately, we obviously want to make sure that people have got good support and access to counsellors as needed. Uh, we, we do have that support at UQ. Uh, our, our research students access that through our student services uh, unit. But um, we do sort of hear that sometimes there's, there's difficulty um, obtaining that quickly enough or being able to see the same person um, on a repeat visit. So we wanted to look into what we could do to enable that uh, and make sure that the, the counsellors were familiar with the unique context of um, the higher degree by research as opposed to an undergraduate student. So, uh, so we're making some recommendations there. Other things to do um, with the student uh, perspective around how they progress. So uh, through their program and obviously a PhD is three to four years. Um, well, not obviously, but uh, it, it is a longer program and for us it is around that time length. So we, we are looking at ways that we help people um, progress and, and have that formative, not just assessment, but also indication of uh, support and, and um, advice along the way. So we, we have annual milestones, but we're looking at uh, can we make those clearer and more consistent for students across, across the university? Um, we have 4,800 um, research higher degree students across UQ, and there does seem to be variation. Uh, in the ways that we monitor their progress and, and give them feedback at the moment. Um, also looking at uh, right back at the beginning, that relationship between uh, their supervisor, um, how that develops and how we can develop um, or set some clearer and, and, um, and more focused sort of uh, expectations at that stage. So can we actually have a clear conversation and, and signal um, what some uh, clear shared expectations could be at that stage? Uh, in terms of the, the candidates' uh, development um, and other resources we could provide, we're, we're thinking around uh, expanding on the wellbeing options that we currently provide. So um, we, we do have uh, our student services uh, team do offer a number of uh, targeted sessions for research students at this time, but we're looking at what else could be done, could those be expanded? Um, we do offer that two-day mental health first aid course uh, we, we pay for that for any uh, research student who wishes to undertake that as well. Um, but what, uh, what else could we be doing in terms of our, um, the CDF is our career development framework. So we do have a, a suite of uh, offerings already that we make available to every research student across the university. Um, and, and they're designed to be um, sort of uh, general, I guess, and, and not discipline specific, but um, really targeting those transferable skills that um, Stacey was mentioning around um, professional skills, um, personal um, uh, communication skills, and also some research uh, skills as well. So we're looking at, can we expand those? Can we also expand the career advising support around those as well? Um, and we know that research students are all coming with different backgrounds, different career journeys as well. So we want to um, see a consistent um, and really you know, well-developed individual development plan that could be used for every student to really signal that conversation at the beginning with their supervisory team, what do they need? And that can be updated ideally along the way, um, but really is customized for them. Um, in terms of research environment, and Stacey was describing some of those um, outcomes we were seeing there that really sat at the local level and, and you know, we're, we're cognizant that we've got lots of local environments. So what can we do to just make sure that we're seeing um, 
things that we know make a difference actually, um, you know, be, be developed and, and improved. So we want to do some uh, local scans and a needs analysis there. Uh, we're thinking of a tool or something we could use to help our, our um, colleagues in each area look at those things. Um, we're looking at um, that uh, importance of the peer network, as, as you heard Stacey mention, um, you know, how can we strengthen those? We've got student leaders and representatives and we've got a postgraduate student society. So how can we sort of activate those and, and, um, and make sure that peer network's around uh, for every student? And space came up as a big issue. I should say our student partners actually had a very strong voice in us developing these. Uh, and uh, they, they had a range, the six students had a range of different experiences. And, um, and it's, it's that sense of community, I guess, when we were talking about space, being co-located again with peers and in that local research community uh, makes a big difference. Uh, and then onto the um, supervisory team and in particular the principal supervisor, we want to again make sure that um, everybody has access to mental health awareness training. We have a short course as well as the two day first aid course so um, we're looking to um, make sure people engage with those more. Um, supervisor development, so we do have a program that um, every uh, principal supervisor will need to do uh, to renew on our uh, register um, and happy to talk more about that with anybody um, at another time but that program is designed to keep people updated and to um, to make sure that people are aware of um, you know it, significant things impacting their supervision including um, boundaries relationships um, mental health awareness and um, career and, and development of the candidates. So we want to just uh, make sure there's a stronger focus there on supporting wellbeing and that work-life balance that Stacey was also talking about as well. Um, we've got supervision awards, so we're looking at ways we can make uh, nurturing and supporting HDR students a little more overt in those. And also um, we're thinking of a community of practice um, targeted for the supervision of, of research students. Um, so obviously sharing best practice and ideas there. Uh, next step, so we're, we're reporting to a couple of committees, um, the UQ Mental Health Strategy Board next week. We've reported to our HDR committee as well recently. Um, and we're now presenting these findings as well to some um, key stakeholders around the university, uh, talking through some um, some feedback people have, but also how, how we can shape these. And some of this work is already underway in some shape or form, but how can we partner and work together to implement um, some more of these um, recommendations? As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, this is designed to be um, what we hope will be a successful longitudinal study. So uh, we're looking to run this again uh, in November. Uh, we've also um, been talking with colleagues at UQ to, uh, um, adapt an ECR version, so an early career uh, researcher version, which I think you can probably see there are a number of parallels there in how we support our, um, our you know, newer um, research colleagues as well. So we're looking to do that. Um, if not this year, then definitely next year. Thank you. That's all. Well, it's fantastic. Thank you so much, Belinda and Stacey. I um, found that so interesting and actually kind of you know, you think about a lot of the recommendations coming out that and how it could actually apply to lots of work workplaces as well, actually, in terms of what people need, taking that person-centred approach to supporting their wellbeing, understanding what sort of motivates people to um, have a good experience um, within that journey too, uh, certainly aligns um, really well with the U21 declaration to putting, um, you know, students and staff and universities at the centre of everything we do. So thank you. Um, we will hold off questions and go to um, Elizabeth next, and then we can have some Q&A at the end, if that's okay with everyone. Um, I'd really like to introduce uh, you to Elizabeth uh, Sturdy, who is um, from, hello, <laughs> uh, UC Davis uh, in California. Um, uh, she's, we've got a pre-recorded presentation actually from Elizabeth with Professor Carolyn Dewar as well. Um, uh, for this session today, but Elizabeth's joining us live for the Q&A at the end, which is great. Um, so they have a pre-record presentation on the work that they've been doing to develop and deliver a faculty of 
Faculty Academy of Graduate Student Wellbeing, which trains members across the faculty of UC Davis to deliver graduate student seminars on mental health and wellbeing within graduate programs and looking at a train the trainer model as well. So I'll hand over to um, Diego if you're able to share um, the screen and play the pre recorded video, that would be great. Hello everyone, thank you so much for the invitation to speak to you all today. Today we wanted to share with you a little bit about the Faculty Academy of Graduate Student Wellbeing at UC Davis. I'm Elizabeth Sturdy, Director of Mentoring and Academic Success Initiatives for Graduate Studies at UC Davis, and I'm joined by Professor Carolyn Diwa. Do you want to introduce yourself, Carolyn? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us. I'm a professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Public Health Sciences. And um, we're really glad to be able to share what we're doing here at Davis. So we just wanted to start out by sharing a little bit about what's happening with graduate student well-being um, in the US. So the Council of Graduate Schools just issued a report that about a third of graduate students are reporting symptoms consistent with PTSD, anxiety or depression. They found that anti-Blackness, the pandemic, and career uncertainty were all factors. Um, we also know at UC Davis, we've done surveys that our, our students are struggling. Um, so well-being is becoming more of an important topic than ever. There was also a recent report um, done in the US this year about the role of faculty in supporting student mental health. They found that two in 10 professors did report that supporting a student's well-being did impact their own mental health. About 30% were experiencing um, symptoms of depression of their own. And only about half understood how to recognize a student that was struggling, and a majority wanted more professional development on this topic. So this course that we're talking about in the academy um, really comes out of experience that I've been that I had at doing gatekeeper training for mental health. And one of the professors who took the, the gatekeeping course contacted me and was fairly um, persistent in wanting to have a course for her students. And so this is what emerged from it um, that that course that there was a needs assessment with her students. So it wasn't public health, it was plant biology where we started and genetics. And they wanted a course for their first year um, cohorts coming in. And so this is what we have, the graduate well-being course. It um, It is, and it's, we've given it three times. So once before the pandemic and twice during the pandemic and what we cover is it's a five week session and we cover what it what well being means. Um, we take a public health approach. So how to promote mental health and then we go into some self care and um, how to address stress as a graduate student. And so we go over tools. The thing about this course is because it is a seminar course, we also go into the science behind it. Um, interestingly, we're talking to plant biology and genetic students, so the study design and the methodology that we often use in social sciences to study this is new to them. So we also go into some of the study design and how do you know it's a good paper um, and if it was rigorously done. So it combines that how to evaluate the evidence. And so one of the things that we um, got feedback was that it helped legitimize some of the tools that they've been hearing about. So we talk about that. We also talk about self-efficacy and self-care, the evidence for that and how it, it promotes mental health. We talk about problem-solving tools, um, conflict resolution, and the psychosocial work environment, work-life balance. So when we um why are we talking to graduate students at the end of every um in the beginning and the end of each course we have um questionnaires we also they have a final assignment which is an essay in which they're asked to answer three questions one what did they learn 
two, how did they use it, and three, how they will use it as TAs. So how they will pass it on and to, to have them start thinking about how it could benefit um, the students that they teach um, and they touch. And so some of the things that came out from these essays are um, what their experiences have been like. And so on the, in the bolt is the um, summation and underneath it are quotes from, from the essays. Students find that their usual coping me mechanisms that they that they use they went to to before graduate school don't necessarily work while they're in graduate school, and part of that may be because of the compounded stress that they face from different um, dimensions while they're in school. They also talk about feeling overwhelmed um, and hopeless, and it's wearing. Graduate school is wearing because you don't often in when you're in the middle of it see the end and how you're going to get through it you just see the challenges and um, that takes a toll on their well-being so um, next slide they also find when they're in the middle of things that graduate school can be discouraging and sometimes as they're working on things it seems that maybe it's of importance to them and maybe their advisor, but who else will find their work significant? significant? And that can be discouraging. Um, there's constant self-doubt where I, and I found this to be um, a very, um, one of the, the quotes that, that I came away with and, and think about a lot, that a student describes every success feels like a total shock and every failure feels like it is to be expected. And so there is that, that self-doubt and, and um, that they constantly face. And at the same time, they don't really have time to reflect. They don't have time because we're on a quarter system, which is 10 weeks, which goes by very quickly. And so they don't have time to look up and maybe step back and think about what they're doing and how to approach it and how to take um, the context and that also doesn't give them much time to, to, to think about their well-being and how to take care of themselves. So it is a challenging time for them as graduate students. So in the course, we found we weren't sure whether it would work using Zoom. The first iteration of the course was face-to-face. Um, -face. We had about 30 students in a room. We weren't sure about whether that contact over Zoom would be helpful. And what we did find was about 75% thought it helped with this challenges and, and the stress that they found during COVID. Um, they also found that that interaction, even though it was by Zoom, um, was very, very um, helpful. And they found that was over 80, 85% said that. And part of that is because I think the breakout sessions, um, the breakout rooms that we're able to have in Zoom, they can talk in a safe place without professors overhearing or anybody else overhearing, um, and which we can't do in a large room because you can't get that space. And so that was one of the, the unexpected benefits of Zoom. And then about 90% or over 90% thought this was important that the department offers this. So they thought it, it was important because it signaled that the department was interested in their well being. They didn't have to take the course on their own time during lunch or after classes. It was offered as a class, it's a one unit class um, that they're able to take. And so there was um, the reassurance that the department was carving out time for them to, to understand and, and gain these skills about their well being. So. In addition to the tools, they talked about they um, were, it reinforced that self care was important. A lot of the things that, that we cover in class, it, they hear about in popular press. 
you pick up a magazine, you turn on um, the TV, there's there's always something about well-being and, and stress. But they had the thing that was different was that it was organized and it was reinforced. And they had peers to, to help reinforce how important it was. Next slide. And that peer in the social network was so important because it helped them understand that they weren't alone. It normalized the feelings of stress and um, discouragement, that it was a common thing to the graduate ex experience. And because we, um, in the second and third iteration of the courses, we had physics, chemistry, math, um, biology, different departments together, they saw and understood that they weren't alone in what they were feeling and the doubt that they felt. And they could help with the tools um, to structure it, to problem solve and how to address it. And they learned from one another and that enriched their experiences and they made friends and, and connections across the campus. And so this, this last quote is um, really summarizes what we were trying to do with the course and, and what they got out of it. They, because they're graduate students and we used a research-based approach, it, they saw the value and it was data informed, it was scientifically backed. Um, there was evidence-based solutions and they saw the evidence. Now, my research is on workplace and mental health. And so the evidence that we looked at was the evidence that you would hope to see if you introduce this into workplace. For example, productivity, um, the, the outcomes are, are work related. So it wasn't just um, symptoms, which are important, but they also saw some um, more concrete um, outcomes that were relevant to them. The opportunity to discuss the topics was also important. So we are doing this again. And so hoping to offer this course to more students, we have a, an academy in which we have a cohort of 19 faculty who step forward and want to understand the course content to be able to deliver the course um, this coming year. The other thing that we're trying to do is build a community of faculty so that we can exchange ideas, people who have like-minded, um, and are looking um, to, worth for, to achieve the same objectives of student well-being in their programs. And so we are in the midst of it. We had our first day uh, yesterday um, and it was, we had very, very interesting discussions. Elizabeth, do you want to talk about some of your impressions? Yeah, it was just so exceptional to get faculty across all disciplines. We had all of our four colleges represented as well as our professional schools. Um, so a real variety and discipline and also a variety of and seniority of different um, professors that were participating, but they were all so passionate about supporting graduate student well-being. Um, so it's been a really exciting experience so far. So we're looking forward to it. We're hoping to expand it next year. So if you're interested, please contact Elizabeth and to give you more details. All right, thank you so much. And now we can take some time for questions. Thank you. That's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, oh, that was amazing. Thanks, Elizabeth. And good to see actually there's so many um, linkages too between the two presentations, picking up some of those themes around peer support and um, you know, opportunities for self care and, and taking um, time to, you know, uh, find opportunities to relax and look after themselves as well. So I really appreciate um, that um, uh, presentation from yourself and Caroline. That's great. So maybe we've got five minutes um, left and I might throw over to um, Stuart to, to sort of ask a couple of questions if that's okay. Thank you very much. Uh, two uh, excellent presentations and uh, um, uh, Please encourage sort of colleagues to uh, to add any questions to the chat function so I can sort of ask them on your behalf. But whilst uh, you're thinking of questions to pose to our presenters, I'm going to start with um, Belinda and Stacey. And I know you're joining us at the University of Queensland next week, 
at our UQ Mental Health uh, Strategy Board. I think one of the one of the findings that surprises me most from your work is the high level or the higher than average level of, of well-being uh, experienced by HDR students. Of course, it shouldn't surprise me, given the, the great work uh, that you do within the UQ Graduate School. But in these straightened economic times, how do we make the case then that we need to invest further in student well-being if we're already seeing higher than average uh, levels of, of, of well-being uh, in this cohort? Linda, I'm happy to answer. So it's actually something we need to consider that this data was measured um, in 2020. And actually this pattern where people are engaged and happy, but also burnt out and exhausted and distressed is evident in employee data as well, like the Gallup poll. It's the first time that's ever been observed, uh, for example. So I think everyone sort of is in emergency mode um, they've been coping with a lot that's going on for a long time now um, with the pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, you know, only going to go so far. <laughs> you can sort of operate at that level. Uh, so I think we do need to keep that in mind. Um, but I would also say that um, I think doing a PhD is a bit like that as well, because it's this incredibly, it can be incredibly intrinsically motivating and rewarding. People often choose it. Uh, to do something to sort of change their life or to do something they think is meaningful or significant. Um, but at the same time, it has significant challenges that can also be very distressing, um, you know, can exhaust you, burn you out. And also sometimes it can be quite lonely. So it's, it does sort of have these two faces. And so we probably do have a little bit of work to do to address um, some of those more negative experiences. Something we didn't share was that we also asked them about that expectation of the PhD being more positive or negative um, than what they originally expected. And the mean for that is actually in the negative. Um, so more of our cohort is saying it's actually a bit more negative than I thought when I think about it overall. Excellent. Thank, thank you very much. And uh, mindful of the time, I'm going to move to, uh, to Elizabeth, if, if I may, uh, and, uh, and, and ask around sort of... Um, uh, I'll pick up the question around sort of a protected time for students to attend the workshop and for faculty, um, but also extending that, if I may, I'm sort of particularly mindful of the data you presented at the beginning of the presentation around the impact of supporting others uh, on uh, staff mental health, uh, and what strategies are you putting in place to reduce the impact uh, on staff of being part of this community of, uh, of, of supporters? Yeah, great question. So, um... The course is a seminar course, so more of an elective that students are taking for about one unit. Um, so there are cases where that can't be a challenge. We were addressing them earlier today, particularly our master students. Their coursework only are really accelerated programs. Um, we talked about different times um, for longer programs where there are key um, phases where the students will really benefit from this content and they have a little more flexibility. Um, we also started talking about building it into extended orientation programming for first years um, so that they could get these tools and strategies early. Um, so it, it is up to the departments to really strategize about what's best for their, their students. We do give them flexibility on when they want to offer it. Um, and then that allows them to kind of address a certain phase that they're interested in, a cohort, um, and what like the course uh, dynamics are for their particular discipline. The faculty did volunteer to take on teaching this seminar, um, so there is an acknowledgement that it is additional teaching. Um, we do compensate them um, with some research um, academic funds um, and then are advocating um, that they do get teaching credit and um, additional recognition for that service. The faculty are learning a lot because they're going through the program currently and they're getting all of the resources and strategies and tools to use for well being, which are more universal um, and they're not tailored just to students. And so they're really learning um, strategies for themselves, which was a goal of our uh, academy and for them to be leaders within their programs for other faculty and other students, uh, someone that they can go to that has resources or some more experience with um, this field. Excellent, thank you, Elizabeth. And will you be monitoring the impact on faculty as well? 
Um, so yeah, we're going to, we're going to be having ongoing, um, consultations and meetings with them throughout the year. We're going to follow up after their courses. Um, we have, um, two professionals that they can consult with throughout the year. So we're not abandoning them after this training. Um, they'll have ongoing support throughout the year. Um, and we'll be doing, um, surveys as well. Excellent. Thank you. And if I may now turn to Belinda and Stacey and, uh, uh, and and, and talk, if you wouldn't mind talking about the faculty support uh, that you have within the uh, the UQ Graduate School. Uh, uh, what strategies are you putting in place or are you proposing around supporting those supervisors uh, in particular? Yeah, thanks, Stuart. I think um, a, a couple of things there, and I, I, I take note about the impact on time as well. And it was interesting, um, it, some of our staff um, partners, Stacey will remember the discussion around, you know, what we recommend, we do need to be careful and we don't want to adversely impact on people, even though it's well intended. Um, so we, we do have a, um, a supervisor development program, as I alluded to before, and, and we're mindful of it not um, taking up too much time. We're, we're only making that a mandatory set of modules every five years, um, but to be done in a, um, a community sort of local um, unit, uh, sort of cohort um, environment. But, but alongside that, we've got a number of uh, non-compulsory and, and voluntary um, sessions that people can engage with. Uh, I think I think probably um, the the best way we can um, look at this is to think also about that community of practice, and and that's where we're hoping that that will give that support around people when they need it, when they can engage with it, but not sort of um, you know impacting too much on on people when they're really uh, needing to focus on other things. So we're looking at ways we can we can put supports around without making too much mandatory, I guess, as well. Thank you very much. I'm going to hand back to Vivian. I'm conscious of the time. Unmute would be good. Thanks very much, Stuart. Um, and Mary, I hope that that also um, answered one of your questions. I know that there was another one in um, there for uh, Elizabeth to around, um, uh, what was it again? Sorry, I'm just going to go and have a quick look through the thing. Uh, students to it. Uh, protected academic time for students to attend the workshopping for faculty. So um, maybe if you could just answer that really quickly and then to be able permission to go just a couple of minutes over and then we'll finish up. So the, the course is an elective, so it's on top of the other coursework, um, but the program schedules it around when would be best um, for them. And then the faculty program is um, happening right now. We haven't yet started our fall quarter, so it's um, officially still summer for us. And so they are not teaching currently. So we're catching them before the uh, quarter starts. Thanks so much for that. Um, I'd, yeah, well, I think that'll bring this session to a close. I just, again, would really like to uh, thank Stuart, Belinda, Stacey, Elizabeth and Caroline for participating in the session today and sharing such um, fantastic work. I've just put a link in the chat if you want to know more about the mental health uh, working group at U21 or the declaration, you can um, click on that link. Um, in there has got the declaration, the principles, and also some case studies that we're sharing. So as I said before in the chat, we'd like to actually build that repository of great practice um, and research that's occurring in this space around supporting mental health and wellbeing. So hopefully that um, uh, part of the site will continue to grow and you'll be able to access this information uh, in between annual meetings as well as when we catch up at annual meetings. So thank you again, everyone. And um, yep, take care and stay safe.